Okay, Kofi van der Lindes, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, you've been director at the Klingendal International Energy Program for over 20 years. You're also a professor at Groningen University, specializing in geopolitics and energy, I believe. Exciting, and been, isn't it? It, it? It sounds exciting, honestly, to me as a political scientist, <laughs> it sounds great. Um, and you've also been following the gas market and the natural gas market in particular in the Netherlands and in Europe for over decades. Um, I want to start with a simple question. Where in a quite a special room. Where are you right now and what is your role here? Um, we're actually at the moment visiting uh, the uh, uh, Institute Klingendal. Uh, we both, uh, this is the big house where the, in the big institute has, uh, has its offices and also obviously its uh, lecture rooms or meeting rooms. And we reside in the park and we were going to sit outside today but uh, the weather turned uh, uh, a little bit grimmer than we had uh, anticipated, right. so I asked friendly whether we could use their premises. Yeah, because we still need to deal with the COVID measures, of course, but yes. we're sitting at quite a distance from each other. The windows are open, so all fine. So Klingendal, is, is that an independent institution or how does it get funded? Is it governmental or non-governmental? Um, no, the, the big institute is different, so the, the, the Klingendal International Energy Program is uh, residing under a separate foundation. There's basically two foundations here in the park. And we have our own uh, uh, income and, uh, and own uh, governing board, uh, but obviously we do collaborate where we can and as much as possible. So it's, yeah. yeah you get funded to do research or? Um, yeah, that, that goes through our own finances, through, through the program, the energy program. Uh, but uh, at the moment, for instance, we're doing a, a training uh, a course together with, uh, with the uh, Klingendal Academy here for uh, uh, people from uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Okay. So we do, we do uh, try to bring yeah, the, the best of our uh, skills together and, uh, and do programs together. Okay, and uh, what brought us here today, it's certainly a hot topic, is gas. Absolutely. We read and hear about it all the time, about first of all the rising gas prices, but the closure of the Groningen gas fields and then opening up again the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, um, the rise in demand from China or in Asia in general, um, and also the role of gas as a transition fuel. So it seems like we, we will not be speaking just about how to heat our homes, it's a whole domain of geopolitics. So let's first start at the beginning. How can you give us a brief history of the history of gas in the Netherlands? And maybe also uh, uh, start for what it's used, because also that right. differs in exactly. different countries. So uh, maybe the, the Netherlands is a very atypical country. Uh, atypical that we uh, heat uh, more than 95% of our homes are uh, gas heated, uh, which is not typical for most countries. So uh, what is the other 5%? Um, uh, yeah, uh, farms that are too far away from the grid okay. and have their own system. And obviously some houses already have been disconnected. So yeah. I'm so trying Pretty to much every house is Pretty is much gas. every house, which is, which is not the case in other countries. So for instance, in Germany, uh, in Eastern Germany, uh, heating oil is still very important. And the same for Eastern France. So w where the electricity grid uh, is not uh, laid out enough or uh, other fuels cannot reach them, they still use quite a lot of heating oil. Um, in Poland they still use a lot of coal, so it's, 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 uh, and, but they also have quite a lot of gas in more, uh, you know, closer to the gas uh, uh, pipelines. So it depends very much where you are and, and what the resource history was of your country. And the Netherlands of course is, is special because uh, we, uh, so we have the built environment is very gas intense, uh, but also our industry was built around the fact that uh, the Netherlands has been a gas exporting country, net exporting country, for decades, uh, since the uh, beginning of the 1960s when the Groningen field was developed, and then in the 1970s also the North Sea production uh, came into, uh, uh, was developed. So uh, we have a very long history in gas, and, and, and much has been organize around it and you know if you, if you in the history so the Netherlands was lucky to find gas when did they find that, that, that um, gas field in the, 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 I think it was the 50s. late 50s 1958 yeah. okay. or something like that um, 1959 actually okay. sorry okay I have to correct myself um, and so so for the Netherlands uh, in the beginning uh, they were a little bit in a hurry because at the time uh, and also, if you look at the development of the European institutions, you can see that they thought nuclear was going to be the next big uh, energy source. Uh, 
Um, and so uh, when they found gas, they were a little bit in a hurry to, uh, to think, okay, how long is this gas future going to be before it's going to be pushed aside by, uh, by nuclear? Um, so it's funny the way we have our discussions today about what is a transition fuel and what is, uh, uh, or stranded assets, or that you commit yourself to a route where, where you don't want to. It, it's a lot more dynamic than we think, and sometimes um, with gas it wasn't uh, so dynamic at all that it was actually a stayer for a lot longer than, uh, than initially uh, anticipated. Um, and so that's why they, they wanted to export from the beginning. Um, in order to monetize the uh, the resource uh, uh, as quickly as possible. Because the gas field was huge, right? Or well, in the beginning, they didn't really know that much about okay. how big the gas field okay. is, and so maybe I mean I grew up. Uh, I mean, I was uh, uh, where I where I was born. We were probably the last uh, uh, region in the in the Netherlands that was connected where to was the that? gas. That was in the south of the Netherlands, in Sils uh, Vlaanderen, um, and. Um, and so we were on call in the house, and I, I still remember how jealous we were when we, we visited our families in uh, in uh, in South Holland that they already had central heating, while my mother was still every morning cleaning the coal heater oh, and wow. uh, having to go outside to uh, to get a uh, a bunch of coal to uh, get the day going. You also meant that only one room in the house had heating. Yeah? Wow. And. Um, so, so no so bedroom heating, no central heating in the house. It's just your yeah. living room. No, it's just you know you got a hot water bottle. Yeah, if it was yeah. really cold, um, and an extra blanket if you were lucky. Um, so so uh, this this whole perspective changed, of course, uh, two reasons. You're right. I mean, later on when they uh, they began to produce the field, they found out that uh, yeah that there was a lot more to the gas field than what they initially thought. Um, uh, and so in the beginning we had a feeling, uh, because the, the gas companies had to report every year to uh, Parliament, uh, do we still have enough gas for the next 25 years, mm -hmm. so otherwise you have to start thinking about right. what then. Yeah. Um, and, and that answer became such an automatic, of course, that uh, maybe the Netherlands has always been spoiled in this way. We never had the discussions or dilemmas that other countries had where uh, their coal was not as productive anymore and really had to think about how do you switch to something else and then become more in yeah. import dependent. So, uh, and, and, and then of course we also have a lot of industry built around the gas we had. Because yeah. yeah. that, is, that, is, that, that whole infrastructure that we have is often called the European gas roundabout, right? Like the gaswatonde or yeah, okay, what do we owe that title? Now, now we're jumping a bit. Well, okay. it's because we invented that ourselves. Okay, it's our own title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you can argue that maybe there was already a roundabout. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, but um, no, uh, that idea came like, I think there is a big difference in terms of policy making when you, when you think your field is half full or when you think your field is half empty. Right. And so around the time when we realized uh, in the community of energy and in, in the discussion, uh, they began to talk about half empty, you could see that there was, the thinking began uh, on how are we going to handle the post uh, uh, Groningen gas and production. When did that begin, uh, that, that thinking? That was around the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. And, um, so, so that, that began then, but it also, uh, Groningen had not been producing that much because we also preferred to produce the gas from the North Sea first. So mm -hmm. Groningen was basically used as a very flexible supplier and, and because of that flexibility it had gained a very important role on, uh, also on market surroundings. You know, because it was basically used as a, yeah, almost as your, your very large reserve mm -hmm. uh, field. Um, and of course, when, when, uh, when also the North Sea fields matured, uh, they matured, uh, maybe geol ge the geology was, uh, uh, um, was a factor, but also... So what does that mean exactly, maturing in gas fields? Well, that, that, that the, the number of fines, good fines, uh, investable fines, was declining. Okay. Uh, but that had also to do with the fact that the tax treatment changed on the small field policy, so that, that kind of coincided a bit. And also it coincided with the whole discussion about liberalization and uh, establishment of the internal gas market. Yeah, because the Netherlands was one of the first EU member states to, to really liberalize their, their gas markets, right? Um, 
Where did you read that? Yeah, well, in the, in the early 2000s, right? The Netherlands started liberalizing their gas market and uh, short-term contracts were a result of that. Why did well, that happen? Well, no, no, it, I think, what, you, I think uh, what, you try, what you're referring to is that, um, because I wouldn't say that we liberalized first, there was a yeah. lot of pressure. Um, we have to, you have to understand that the European Union was basically a union of gas importing countries, right. you know, netto consuming countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the U United Kingdom and then Norway in the uh, uh, economic zone uh, and the Netherlands were the producers. And if, if you look at developments on how the market is regulated and where uh, the rents yeah, can be uh, consumed or uh, taken, then of course there is a, a dispute between producers and consumers. Yeah. Yeah? Um, the, uh, the regulation uh, favored the consumer. Yeah, they're very clear about that. That they wanted the consumer to benefit from more competition in the market, right. and that these benefits should be at the consumer. Uh, which, of course, as a producer country, I mean, uh, let's be frank. The Dutch government had very, for a very long time, uh, uh, a very nice income from gas sales. Yeah. Right. Um, and so uh, I wouldn't say that we, w we, we stood at the, on the first step to say let us uh, liberalize all this and give right. away these benefits. Uh, that's okay. why I'm protesting mm -hmm. a bit. Um, on the other hand, because the discussion had already started and, and there was uh, in policy circles there was a realization that um, uh, at some point also the Netherlands would not be a net exporter anymore and that we were part of this European gas market uh, that we should um, we should adapt to that. So in 2005, the uh, Gasuni, which used to be both sales and, and, and the uh, transportation system, was split in two companies. Um, so, and, and that was, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say the first, but it was around the time when everyone had to do okay. that. Okay. <coughs> um, sorry. Um, so, but, but, the, but yeah, the liberalization agenda did, uh, did change uh, the whole makeup of the industry. Because we started relying on short-term contracts because of it, or not? Yeah, but that was that was not initially the case. No. Eh? So, um, uh, because Europe wanted to, uh, I think the discussion really changed after 2004, and the East European countries came into the European Union, and they had all these old uh, Soviet time and Comic-Con time contracts that came along, that they, uh, the whole liberalisation and and uh, contracts with this destination clauses that that, that wouldn't work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And and so um, uh, there's been quite a lot of pressure to renegotiate these long-term contracts. Um, and I think it is it is it is around that time uh, the Netherlands still has some of of, of these older contracts, um, but not not uh, predating 2000. Yeah? And uh, the, I think the. They're all early 2000s when gas prices were also rising uh, for a while. That um, uh, uh, that the discussion about long-term contracts was was pretty was a lot of pressure on the European uh, gas industry at large uh, to uh, um, to look at these long-term contracts. Europe has been trying to get uh, wanted information, yeah, even though it's between two commercial mm -hmm. parties. They wanted to yeah. look at the contracts. Yeah. And, there was a lot, uh, quite a lot of discussion, uh, but in the gas market, uh, the sanctity of contracts is, is, is quite important for security of supply. And right. Right. Uh, also because, of course, a, a very big contract that, that European companies had was, was, was already in 1980s with, uh, with the Soviet Union. And uh, so, so that was a period where at some point the Netherlands, uh, and, and there you're right, that the TTF, when at some point the pressure was high and they want to look at the contracts, that they said, okay, we nominated on the TTF, and uh, and so, uh, but that was still the the volume of contracts, yeah, was still very very small at the, at that time. Okay, okay. and moving and to Norway, uh, by the way, immediately followed suit. Uh, that in the same year, that was uh, uh, Norway did the same. But to say that all these contracts are over, no. In 2006 and seven, when oil prices were really high mm -hmm. and then gas prices were still connected to oil prices, uh, Berlusconi of Italy, Sarkozy of France, and uh, I think it was already uh, uh, Frau Merkel, they all traveled to Moscow together with their energy companies mm -hmm. and concluded the last generation of long-term contracts, which they, in 2012, when yeah. gas prices fell and uh, and oil prices fell, uh, they all 
and, and short-term contracts were cheaper, they all went into arbitration with these contracts to renegotiate the terms. Right, so looking at these long-term contracts, uh, the Russian state gas company Gazprom asked for these long-term contracts. Um, why did they want this? Well, it, it has to do with how you build a value chain. So, um, uh, in the 1980s, it was very logical. They had to, um, yeah, b ramp up um, their gas production, build a lot of new pipelines to bring the gas to markets. Um, the East European countries were not very keen because they they uh, preferred oil, and so Russia, what is now Russia, told, basically told them, "Well, congratulations, you're also going to get gas." Uh, because it's nice to have also gas consumption on your way to your final market. Um, they concluded uh, contracts, but in order to, what you do with a long-term contract is you, you, you share the risk on volume and price in the contract between buyer and seller. Uh, the seller also has an interest not to let the buyer go bankrupt because then you can't sell gas. Mm -hmm. Just like the buyer has an interest in um, that the seller can invest enough so that his supplies are secure. So uh, that was organized, yeah, usually when you begin with a, a new value chain, that's the structure in which companies mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we have to realize that because we might be seeing the same sort of things happening in these new markets that we're now building. Um, of course, at some point when pipelines have been there for 10, 15, 20 years. The relationship has been there for a really long time at this point. Yeah, but not only that, but I mean, you, you have a much denser gas network. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you can reach uh, so many more destinations. You, the, the, re the rationality for the long-term contracts may change. And so usually what happens with these contracts, then you renegotiate the terms. But of course, what Europe wanted uh, because the old contract said if you sold to Germany, and Germany uh, that year didn't use uh, uh, all the gas that they had purchased, they couldn't resell it to Belgium who had not bought enough. Yeah? So the destination clause, when you want to build an internal market, makes sense that you, uh, you don't do that. On the other hand, for suppliers, it could imply that they would compete against their own mm -hmm. gas. That's how it felt. Huh? Yeah. And um, of course, uh, another oddity I, th I always find really interesting is, um, and we see that at the moment uh, too, uh, um, with all these discussions about routing or whatever. Legally, when gas, wherever it comes from, enters the European Union, it becomes European gas. Yeah. So how, how does that work does exactly? That it, it means that it's, it's part of the European... Um, Ownership? Uh, n not necessarily, it might still be of a company, but it's regulated under European law. Yeah? Right. Okay. And so sometimes you have countries that say, uh, and you now see quite a lot of flows coming in through Germany, but that, uh, as a matter of fact, a part of the pipeline that normally brings Russian gas into Western Europe is now carrying the same gas to Eastern Europe. Yeah? So um, and then they say, oh, but you know, we're still depending on uh, Russian gas. Eh? This is in, sometimes in Eastern Europe the discussion. So they, they, they deny <laughs> that legally the internal market exists by saying that the gas doesn't lose its nationality. So coming back to the demand for long-term contracts by well, the, the long -term, gas Long-term contracts, there's two demands that the Russians had. Is, uh, they, 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 were, they were unhappy about the fact that we wanted to uh, in, uh, with the TTF, for instance, you have gas-to-gas -gas competition that's been part of the liberalization. And they were unhappy because they, they are a big supplier to Europe. They were in the past, they were uh, then, and they will also be uh, in the future because it's the cheapest gas available for the European market. Um, and, uh, and they were afraid that if there was any price changes that they would be... Um, uh, 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 they would look upon Gazprom as if they had manipulated the price. So they rather had an oil price where they couldn't influence prices uh, because that market is organized differently and if someone manipulates the price or changes the price be because of production policies, mm -hmm. then it's OPEC so and not Russia itself. The fact that it was ignored and that we have a lack of supply now, doesn't it show some arrogancy on the part of the Netherlands or the EU? Well, it, it, it it it, um, it, sh it shows um, it sh it shows that we rely too much on a buyer's market, yeah, 
and that we didn't really think through what happens when supply are tight. When the regulation in Europe was made, China, as a, the largest importer of gas, was not even in play. Yeah? So the world has changed, but our regulatory system mm -hmm. has not adapted. Right. Yeah? So uh, I'm not saying we were wrong then, it's just that uh, we should have taken on board these new insights that we get from the market each, uh, each time. And another fact, so uh, with regard to Russia, so, um, um, so they were unhappy about the gas to gas competition and afraid that, that uh, it will be, would be used as an argument against them. And secondly, they wanted, in order to, for their investments, they, uh, they, um, they had to accept the gas to gas competition. Uh, they even set up their own exchange, uh, but um, they did want to have some certainty about the volumes. Um, uh, why? Because if you make an investment, you, you, you want to have some certainty about uh, the volumes, also the volumes going through your pipelines. Um, but of course today the market is completely different because China has, uh, has, I mean, has done a lot of things in the last decades that has surprised us. It's a very, very large market. Uh, I still think that people sometimes, you can't compare that to the Netherlands, you can't even compare it to Europe. Yeah? Um, that that we, we sometimes have difficulty to wrap our heads around the size yeah, of, of China's demand in oil, but also in natural gas, yeah? and therefore its uh, impact that if a small change in China can have a humongous uh, impact on the LNG market if something changes. And um, I, I think there, um, uh, with regulation, uh, we, sh we should have perhaps been much more proactive, thinking through, okay, what's happening? Um, because basically, we still have the three priorities of energy policy, which is, is it affordable, is it uh, secure, and is it clean? Yeah? So, um, for governments, and in this case, because it's the European Union who says it, I think they, they, they were way too optimistic that supply would always be very, uh, uh, very uh, ample supplies and therefore a buyer's market. And they haven't really thought through the implications of, um, uh, of tight supply markets. Right. But, there is, there is a but. Um, uh, because the Netherlands is, does take a special position. I think in particular the Netherlands uh, because we, we still have long-term contracts in Germany, in Italy, and uh, so the, there is, you can't blame just the European regulation alone uh, for, the, the, for the decision. I think what makes the Netherlands, uh, again, an outlier is um, we only had a very small contract that kind of a, it was almost our training wheels, the current contract we still have with, uh, with Russia to see how, how that worked. Um, um, we, of course, were confronted with a much quicker uh, declining production rate on, uh, on the Dutch gas production uh, as a result of the uh, earthquakes in Groningen. Yeah? So um, uh, I think that was not anticipated, but it was fact of life. And the fact that it happened in an amply supplied market was maybe uh, uh, a good thing for the, people's, uh, for, for the markets around us. Otherwise, the impact would have been greater. Um, but uh, the Netherlands, um, because we were so, so focused on trying to solve the mess that uh, existed uh, around the whole Groningen yeah. thing, mm -hmm. we never thought about, and, and it's not because they, we didn't talk about it, but they were too busy doing other stuff in gas than focusing on security of supply. So we never had a discussion is um, are the portfolios that uh, that companies have here on the Dutch market it, is it a healthy portfolio with uh, sufficient term contracts I'm not saying 30 years but five and ten and twelve is maybe reasonable um, our companies are still relatively small mm -hmm. in Europe compared to, to compete with the big firms from uh, from Asia uh, that's an issue that also has not really come into the discussion and so I think um, even this summer, um, yeah, everyone expected that Gazprom would bring its unsold mm -hmm. gas yeah. to Europe. Just bring so, it to us. Yeah, unsold well, gas. What I, 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 I is, is, while researching this topic, we realized that there is, for when 
unexpectedly the gas supply in the Netherlands is low, we have something called a shutdown plan or afschakel plan mm-hmm. by Wiebes, with then Minister Wiebes. Mm-hmm. Does this plan work in practice, you think? Is it successful in what, it, what it's supposed to do? Um, yeah, you can re- reduce gas demand, but the economic yeah. damage, of course, is quite high. Because but what is that plan exactly? Could you explain it? Or, or uh, not exactly, not the details? I don't even know the Who the calls who in crisis? What, yeah. what it's interesting is that... Because curbing demand is the last thing you want to do, right? right. That's yeah. when you really have physical, really physical shortages. The currently, we're just fight, we're struggling with high prices. Right. 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 So it's a, an extreme situation, but it's interesting that we have a plan for when we are in crisis, but when looking at how to avoid a crisis in the first place, it surprises us that the Ministry of Economic Affairs chose to close the Groningen gas fields without replacing the supply with an alternative reliable source. So we were wondering, has any geopolitical risk assessment been done when deciding to close the Groningen gas fields? Um, well, we, we, th- there was discussions about it. I mean, uh, um, and, uh, and, and certainly not um, uh, only these res- assessments, but we've had uh, discussions about the merits of uh, having a very good uh, mixed portfolio, mm-hmm. uh, and that maybe the Netherlands had too much uh, rely too much on the short term uh, uh, market. Were you consulted? Uh, I was part of the discussion. I, I wouldn't say I wasn't consulted. I hope I hope uh, I, I said wise things there. Um, so what did you advise hmm? when concerning concerning the closure of Groningen? What, what was your advice? Oh, I was not involved in that at all. Okay, so you were not involved no, in we, that. Uh, okay. Afterwards, uh, when that decision was made, we had a discussion how we were or going to organize gas flows to the Netherlands. Right. So and prior to that, you were not consulted no, no, about no, 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 exactly. But in the yeah. process of closing, was there a geopolitical mm-hmm. assessment? In the, in the process of closing Groningen? I have no idea. Okay. Isn't that surprising? Considering the consequences. No, I, I mean, they might have consulted other people. I mean, it's... Uh, there was the, the whole gasgebouw involves quite a lot of uh, yeah. in uh, very professional uh, uh, experts. So uh, the fact that they haven't asked me, I, I wouldn't yeah. say that that no, is. No, but what we're asking is that it seems that that the Groningen gas field is, is a geopolitical asset for the Netherlands, and it seems as if it's been closed under political pressure at home, but that we haven't really had a debate on the geopolitical consequences of not having our own gas production coming no, in, or, or you, limited supply. If you put it that way, but on the other hand, um, uh, given how the debate went and, mm-hmm. um, uh, and the fact that, that uh, uh, people feel unsafe, made uh, basically the, the license to operate evaporated very quickly. Right. Yeah? So then you get into a different reality. Uh, of course, you would have uh, liked to have the time, and I'm sure it was also tried, yeah, uh, because uh, there's a big difference between the production in 2012 and where we are at now. Uh, but we also uh, must admit that the, the earthquakes have not stopped yet, and uh, that people still uh, are not. How do you look safe. at the way the government is handling that situation right now? Um, yeah, you you would you would um, well. There's let me put it this way because you can you cannot always because for the also for the government that it's a complicated dossier. Um, but I, I was surprised because I always had the had people want to feel safe, but also if you look at the sociology of certain regions, I I, I think people were were really scared because it it, it was a lot more uh, hefty than what they had experienced before. Um, but also they were. Um, it, it's not, uh, f- for the people who live on top of Groningen, it's not the most rich uh, part of the country. Right. And um, the little bit that people have, if you see that crumble under your hands, you... Like literally. Yeah? <laughs> you literally then, see that then, crumble. Then, then that really uh, does something to you. Because you want, they just like every other uh, person, you want to leave something for your kids, right? Mm-hmm. So, and if you have invested in your own house, and then, you know, some external force kind of destroys it, yeah? Um, uh, and and um, why why we didn't contemplate the Moedijk arrangements, yes, yeah? so that we as uh, taxpayers would uh, offer to buy all the houses, so that people at least could secure the monetary value of their property, uh, and then uh, still fix them up, and so that people could live there, the same people, mm-hmm. um, and maybe maybe come up with something smarter than what we've done now. Yeah, uh, why? Because then. Um, the, the, the feeling that these people have been left fending for themselves for a long time 
might have been um, been able to prevent it. Because is it a I failure think, on the part of the government? Um, I think people. Uh, I mean, th there's been a lot of noise around it as well. Right. Uh, it's been. It's. Uh, I, I think it's a pity that it became so politicized, and or that we let it become so politicized, that um, um, that certain practical solutions were no longer uh, that you couldn't even even uh, uh, do that anymore. I, I feel sorry because that, of course, at the end of the day, it's the people in Groningen who then have carried that weight, right? Right. Um, so, so that is really. Uh, uh, but the, the gas building and the way we you see we until maybe 2012 we we received people from all over the world to come and discuss the institutional arrangement how we had to organize the gas sector because it was public private partnership you know? and other countries were also struggling with the ownership structure that if it was 100% state maybe the efficiency and 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 so quite a, a, a lot of people came. Um, and discussed, you know, how, how, how can you organize that in such a public-private partnership so that you can have both and how much is, uh, how much uh, should you have as a state and how much should be private and um, we have forgotten sometimes um, uh, we've had very successful decades of gas production uh, a lot of welfare in the Netherlands uh, because of gas production. We just, um, we are now totally uh, uh, flabbergasted at the tail end part. Yeah? I mean, we started this interview with, you know, uh, that there's a difference between half empty and half full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, of course, the tail end risk was much higher than what everyone ever anticipated, which is, which is part of, you know, if we study uh, the, the black swans or the kind of the sort of risk that we can envisage of course that's where we uh, messed up as a society yeah, yeah? we really messed up there and in as this a society case or as a, as a, no as also as a society because because um, everyone in the Netherlands um, benefited, benefited um, from from having this great source of uh, of energy, your power comes from gas in the Netherlands. And wealth, I guess. And, right? and wealth. I mean, I'm 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 uh, of the generation that because of these 1973 gas uh, income went up with the oil prices, um, that uh, that people like me could also go to university. And uh, um, how does that link work? So we made more money on gas, and then we started investing it in education. And well, it was quite a jump in income. Uh, I right. mean, that. It, it took a while when the oil price crisis in '73 happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, gas prices would follow three to six months later, and three to six months later, you know, everyone's like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah. Right. And the decision to close Groningen was definitely one that was made by the Ministry of Economic Affairs here. Mm -hmm. But on an EU level, how are strategic considerations made about now increasing our dependency on import from Russia, for example? Um, the the energy mix is still uh, a national uh, decision. It's uh, uh, energy policy is like a, a co, uh, but the energy mix itself, which has been heavily fought, um, is a national because otherwise other countries uh, suppose we had been in a situation in 2012 where the Netherlands um, would like to. Uh, close Groningen because of the danger for people living in Groningen and other countries uh, would have uh, said no we can't miss that source of production um, yeah, can you imagine what would happen then mm -hmm. um, even today in the newspaper if they analyze current market situations whether it's the New York Times or the Financial Times there's always a part of the sentence that says uh, of course the rapid closure of the Groningen production also impacted the um, uh, the exposure to uh, uh, import import risks of uh, of the EU. Yeah, and we are talking about how to deal with Russia, but the question remains: Should we even want to deal with the regime like that of Putin's in the first place? Um, well, that's a that's a moral question. Um, we have always done business with all sorts of countries, yeah? um, not because we thought that was a was gr great fun, 
uh, it's just a fact of life. Yeah? Um, and um, uh, you, can, you can wonder, uh, do we have more influence on a Russia that we isolate and close off, or uh, do we have more influence when we don't do that? Yeah. Would this be your message to European policymakers? Well, the, whether we jump up or down, or this way or that way, it is still Russia as part of the European continent. They see themselves as a European country, and uh, sometimes, you know, if, if we refer to the EU and we say Europe as a shortcut, because EU <laughs> is the sometimes continent. hard to pronounce, um, we, we exclude all these countries that are European, but are not part of the EU. And we, we're not aware of it, but it's felt in countries that are not part of the EU, that we... Yeah. Russia is a special case, I feel like, to do dealings with, uh, especially for the Netherlands. Well, we know, of course, about the stuff that they do in hacking elections in, in the West. Mm -hmm. No, no Directly, I'm, a, the, I'm not saying... But even with MH17, for example, the Netherlands dealing with Russia, like, I know that Rutte barely wants to talk to Putin because of that diplomatic tie being broken. Yeah, yeah, okay, but uh, things have changed in the last couple of years. Um, you began, you began the, the interview with the long history. Right. And the long history is that it, uh, apparently, the way it appears now, that it was easier to do business with the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and know, and, 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 you know, and know what, what, we, what we were Even dealing with. Even during the Cold War. Yeah, during the Cold War. And that we seem to have, and whether that is something that changed in us or in Russia, that we seem to have more difficulties in dealing with uh, with neighboring countries and long term. You see, gas when gas goes through the pipeline, you have a long term relationship mm -hmm. of thirty to forty years at least. Yeah, that's long. But of course, on both ends, things change. Yeah, we talked a long time about the big change for Russia, which they didn't always like. They weren't always made party of that decision because we also have sovereignty over how we want to organize things. And basically what we have experienced this year, in part, is that they also are sovereign to decide what they do with their unsold gas. If we don't have a contract for it, why do we expect them to fill our storages? Yeah? Of course, we did expect it because they have bought the capacity to store there. Yeah? So, but this year, uh, they didn't use that option. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, just like we have... Uh, um, LNG terminals, but not all G LNG terminals are working 100%. So someone has opted to bring that LNG somewhere else. Yeah? So um, in our discussions, we tend to become, uh, we want to analyze the flows of, uh, of, of gas and, and what's going on. And definitely there is, there is some strategic maneuvering yeah, on all, uh, all parts, uh, but we tend to always look elsewhere. Yeah? But it, uh, probably the mistake is that in the dynamics of all these changing relationships in producers, consumers, in Asia, what impacts our market, we're not always honest that um, also we politicize the discussion through Nord Stream 2 uh, and, and other things. Yeah? So uh, it always takes two to tango and in this case there is, yeah, there is enough, yeah, we, we haven't both, yeah? on both sides we have not invested enough to keep this relationship stable enough. Yeah? So what, what could the Netherlands have done differently? And not the Netherlands, the EU. Eh? In this the case, EU. because the EU have to, has to do that. But also the Netherlands used to have I find that, I find bilater that bilateral contacts with Russia. There's a lot of Dutch investment in Russia. I mean, in, in agriculture and we, we used to uh, have all sorts of exchanges. But after... Uh, um, uh, so what about Russia having a, this strong military presence on another European country, if you're talk, not talking about the EU, but Europe as a whole? Um, like their, their military, military presence at the Ukrainian border right now, that those are signs of actual aggression. Do you think something similar, the, the EU, is that in balance what they're doing? That the EU is also making aggressive maneuvers against Russia so that it's justified that they just do a move like that? Yeah, maybe you should see it uh, more as part of a greater uh, play because it's not new things that they're demanding. Uh, we've had a discussion before after the, the Georgian uh, yeah. uh, thing. There was also discussion that the Americans um, at least gave the impression to Ukraine that they could become a member, which the European countries did not want. 
Yeah, they want to stabilize the relationships uh, at the time. And, uh, and now the Americans uh, again, maybe gave the impression again. Uh, and Europe is, uh, is maybe now less in, in uh, uh, certain about what, what to do because they're also put under a lot of pressure by the Americans. Okay, without getting into this too much, but you're also a geopolitics expert. Do you think Russia will invade Ukraine in the coming months? I don't know. You don't know? No, I'm a peaceful person, so I cannot imagine. Uh, I can only begin to analyze again when it happened. I mean, it's the same thing. Right. Did I think, uh, do, do I, uh, with the, with the uh, first go for, for instance, was it rational? I mean, I could analyze quite a lot on, for the actions on uh, uh, what was going on in the oil market and Saddam yeah. Hussein, but the last decision he took, I couldn't understand. Yeah. yeah. And it's the same in this case. Uh, what, what is there to gain for? for Russia, um, I mean, from, a, from an energy market perspective, uh, it probably is not uh, very wise. Not a very wise idea. No. Um, we were talking about the US earlier already, and, and you mentioned Nord Stream 2, the pipeline running from Russia through the Baltic Sea into Europe. Um, what is the role of the US here? Because they, they've been imposing sanctions, threatening with sanctions over opening up this pipeline. Um, what kind of role does that play in the geopolitical situation? Well, then I want to go back to December 2019 because okay. um, uh, just before Christmas, a day before the Americans took, uh, took a decision, actually uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine and the European Union had an agreement on uh, how much Russian gas would transit through the Ukraine with uh, the capacities and whatever. Um, these, these discussions were done under the behest of the, uh, the energy commissioner um, and this was just before um, the new commission started. Um, and I think what came out was, uh, for one thing, Ukraine was, uh, uh, was always very noisy about the fact that if Nord Stream 2 was opened, no gas would go through the Ukraine and you know, if you did the sums, you already knew that uh, they still had to use that some of that capacity. Mm. So it's an empty threat. Or? It's not empty. It's just like um, again, it's like um, Ukraine. Ukraine also needs to draw some attention because they're not doing brilliantly economically, and they have some internal issues, right? Some. So. Um, so, so then they had had it on paper, yeah. How much, uh, and then uh, Ukraine would know uh, which part of their gas system, because it's very large in that country, they had to uh, uh, maintain and and earmark for that sort of transit, because there was an agreement and a contract. Yeah? Um, of course, at, in 2019, everyone still expected that the pipeline would be ready somewhere in 2019. Yeah? And, and now we're two, two years further and it's still not working. Uh, a day after that, the, uh, the American Congress came with this, uh, this threat. So uh, quite a, a f the company that was laying the pipeline, um, uh, and there was uh, 160 kilometers uh, left to go, mm -hmm. uh, had to withdraw from, because they were threatened. Um, and, um, and so then, uh, Gazprom was forced to bring a ship that was working in Asia that could do more or less the same, still had to be adjusted because you need uh, GPS positioning and, and stuff, otherwise you don't qualify under certain agreements, uh, under the permits that you were laid. Denmark was uh, also uh, delaying quite a, a bit on deciding whether, which, part, which route they could use. So in the end, not the route of not seeing one was f fully followed, but they had to uh, divert. So, I mean, there was all sorts of issues, while at the same time they're negotiating of a Norwegian pipeline going into Poland, yeah? Um, so, uh, so, so that was interesting. In, in the same year we had a, uh, the European Commission had a, a, uh, a big decision on how to deal with uh, dominant positions. Uh, so, uh, basically, Gazprom is under uh, quite a lot of pressure to behave in a certain way in, our, in, in the market. And then, and then there was other changes, so Gazprom was in a hurry, that, because if they could have completed the pipeline by February 2001, uh, then we're in 2020, I guess, um, then uh, they would fall under a different rule so they could get a certain exemption, uh, and that's the delay now, and now they have to have a company in Germany. and. Mm. Um, uh, 
because uh, uh, again internal measures were uh, were tightened and the way Germany looks at it was tightened um, and so so it's been yeah it's it's been like uh, it's it's been very difficult to to bring this project yeah but uh, what home. I'm trying to get to is is if these sanctions by the US, if the US wouldn't have been so difficult about this project, would we be in a different place right now in terms of the gas market, um, or the gas prices, or what we're, what we're be looking at? Uh, can we blame the US for the situation? No, I th I, no, no, no. I think what we should say, because I, I, I mean, you can also say that maybe uh, Germany was uh, was under a lot of pressure also from uh, within the EU, yeah. particularly also uh, the East European countries, to make life difficult. Uh, in regulatory terms to make sure that it uh, complied with everything. I mean, uh, also the European Commission, they tried everything to... Uh, um, to make but it difficult I think that maybe we should say, suppose Nord Stream 2 uh, uh, would have been working by this summer, then we probably would have had more supplies. Right. Yeah. Um, because I think um, uh, part of the idea was uh, that... <laughs> Part of the idea was that that um, uh, in Russia the the gas system supplying this new pipeline because it it's, it starts at a different uh, exit point for Russia than than Nord Stream mm -hmm. One, so they adapted the system with uh, with the uh, storages and every so also in Russia quite a lot of investment was done to bring this gas because it's 55 BCM it's quite a lot of gas, um, and so my sense is that they have been bringing that gas to that point uh, and then it, it's, it's not so easy if you think that the German government is going to take a decision any time you're not going to move that gas to another point because no. if they then decide the next day then you can't go back so uh, because not, not all gas routes usually they're one-way streets yeah? only a few pipelines are two-way uh, have two-way possibilities so uh, I, I think uh, that has received very little attention because so Russia is ready to use that pipeline. You're yeah, yeah, basically, the supplies uh, at the beginning of the pipeline are ready to go. Yeah, and and then of course uh, they they uh, because what they don't want to do is to go over the 40 BCM going through Ukraine or mm -hmm. even Belarus uh, because then they have to pay the uh, 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 the spot price for capacity and and then Ukraine will probably charge them a little bit extra for the effort. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I understand it because they, the delay has been quite long. Uh, the additional cost, yeah, we never talk about how costly was this for Russia, uh, building the Nord Stream 2 and uh, having this plan of this pipeline bringing to your most important market. We, we, we don't discuss it because, that's, because it's Russia or Gazprom, we don't care. Yeah? That's, that it's, should I, we care? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that... Um, uh, Gazprom is a big company and, and, and uh, can take care of itself. Yeah? Um, but wh when you talk about a relationship, uh, a relationship means that you are interested yeah, in that you stay upright so that you stay a stable supplier and you are interested in me surviving as a stable buyer. Yeah, it's a mutual have a deal. Relationship. If you, uh, for a couple of years, send out signals that you don't really care. Um, should we be surprised that at some at some point they don't care? Yeah, when you right. you get into difficulty. So all I'm trying to say is, yes, terrible things happen, particularly with the uh, uh, with the aircraft for the Netherlands. Yeah, that's why where I think the Netherlands. Uh, um, I mean, uh, it's just like. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, there's sufficient European countries that could have managed the relationship for us for a while, yeah, while we were dealing with this. Um, but there, yeah, we we have not really invested enough in maintaining the relationship. Algeria is sometimes complaining about the same thing, but I know for a fact that Italy puts a lot of effort in maintaining that relationship, yeah. Uh, Germany, until recently, did put a lot of effort in trying to bring this project home because it was something that Germany really wanted. Because the shock they had in, in the 2000s was that they could be cut off. And Germany cannot 
uh, without consequences, close their nuclear sector and their coal sector for uh, climate reasons, uh, the, the latter for climate reasons, uh, and then you have an intermediate period uh, where maybe you have to rely more on natural gas because all these other molecules that we have in mind are not uh, produced yet. So uh, for them then, the, the two pipelines is really important. So talking about this delay in delivery and lack of supply, mm -hmm. um, we could have had a buffer maybe. So for oil, for example, we have strategic reserves. Yeah. Does anything like this no, exist for gas? Exist. No, and some countries do that voluntarily. Uh, funnily enough, France has a strategic buffer, but uh, this has very little uh, small uh, uh, consumers mm -hmm. uh, of gas. It's mainly industrial uh, fuel, uh, but they do keep some, uh, some strategic uh, gas. France, in general, I think looks at energy much more strategic than uh, some <laughs> others. Um, but no, uh, 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 not in Germany, because if you look at the energy company landscape, mm -hmm. yeah, there was a, um, 10 years ago, there was really big companies who would go with the government and could move and shake. But for example, Gazprom reserved the storage. Should there then be a rule in place that they are also obliged to fill or that they, have, that they face um, a fine well, in I, case they don't? Yeah, that, that's a rule they have in Russia. Yeah? That and in France as well, right? N uh, yeah, yeah, and also in France, but uh, they, uh, it's not a rule that you have... Uh, uh, I mean, in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, Gasterra, and, uh, they still, because they are supplier of last resort when it's min more than minus 12 or less than minus 12, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but not everyone's done that because they relied on Gazprom being, selling its gas. No one has also asked during COVID, because uh, I just recently saw some numbers that the production numbers actually went down in 2020. Why? Also people who are working on, in gas fields uh, and do maintenance. I mean, the Norwegian Snowfeet has been out of production for more than 12 months uh, because you can't send your teams out there, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are, we've been very naive. Think, uh, I mean, we've been very absorbed with what it did to us, but we didn't make the connection that it was also doing that to them. Um, and some countries like the US, uh, uh, that is an important uh, uh, LNG supplier, uh, uh, also suffered in production, is now very quickly catching up again. Um, but also in Russia has been uh, very uh, badly hit by, uh, uh, by COVID-19. Uh, but even Australia, who so far has escaped because of its travel policy, uh, a lot of uh, infections. Uh, even Australia was because uh, the ex what we don't realize is the when companies are organized that your technical teams and the troubleshooters are organized in one place but they can't enter anymore I mean you can only do so much through teams or uh, teams or, yeah. uh, or zoom right <laughs> um, so yeah we've been also maybe a little bit naive how uh, impactful this whole uh, corona crisis has been also on the production side of our economy so in the beginning of this interview, we already mentioned that we're in some kind of transition period to right, right now towards green energy and that gas plays an important role as a transition mm -hmm. fuel. And the EU is even planning to label it as a green energy source. Um, and yet burning natural gas also produces carbon dioxide. Um, I was wondering, when can we expect to de seriously decrease our dependency on natural gas and when can we expect to move away from it entirely? Um. Well, you, you were a little bit quick. The taxonomy is not uh, a declaration that gas is green. Is green. Uh, it just for, uh, for a country like Poland, if they move away from, and it's the same as going on in Asia, by the way, if you move away from coal to gas, you really reduce your CO2 emissions quite by a lot. By half, I read. Yeah, so that's uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah? Um, so um, the question, I think th the reason why it features on the, on the European list is because saying to Poland that they have to go from coal to hydrogen or it's ammonia a or <laughs> is, is like maybe a leap too far and then they stick to coal. Yeah? Right. Um, although the ETS is making that a really a painful uh, uh, place to be, right? If prices go up so much. So uh, I think it's also done to... Um, and particularly because the demands they mark and make then on if you build a new uh, uh, gas plant uh, that it should be uh, clean molecule ready. 
probably the burners or uh, something like that, or CCS ready. Uh, of course, we had this discussion with Cole before. What uh, what does that mean, ready? I'm, sh I'm sure the last word will not be said. So I think we should detect taxonomy. Uh, that's just, uh, yeah, so uh, if, you, if you set targets that are unachievable for some countries, yeah. then they won't even they won't try. Yeah, so I, can, I, I fully understand way. the dilemma of the of commission. We have a lot of opinions about that. Yeah? Sure. Yeah? Yeah. Because well, especially reading it in a headline. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a... No, but I mean, <laughs> it, yeah, I, 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 I'm much more for the pragmatic. I, I want it to succeed, right. the fit yeah. for 55. I don't care how. And at this moment, there's no technology available to electrify a heavy industry like shipping and aviation. So how can we expect to move away from like fossil fuels and gas completely if there is no technology yet? Uh, the, uh, I mean, the government, the whole transition is, is really pushed by government and the pressure is very high. So that also means that you are come. spending a lot of money on developing the technology. Mm -hmm. So we, we should be a little bit technology optimist. Okay. Yeah? I'm not saying yeah. that you should throw <laughs> all your eggs in that basket, but still. Right. Um, and you also mentioned um, hydrogen gas. Politicians are talking about about it as the new thing, but mm. to produce it, it requires a lot of green energy and specialized factories. Well, yeah, no, no, but electricity. Yeah. No, you see, the, the the problem of transition itself is that we we only have discussions about the end state in 2050. What will happen in 2051? Is would always be my. Uh, are, do we stop developing? Yeah. So. Um, I, I think the discussion should be how do we get there because we we have a couple of really yeah maybe difficult tr periods where uh, something is um, what we thought was a good idea and then uh, some maybe some technology surprises us and then all of a sudden you do something else or something just like with nuclear uh, something happens and all of a sudden we don't really think oh maybe this was not the best idea we had so uh, we have Are you to a tech optimist in that sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always take my. I have a. Uh, I've, I've been doing. I've been in energy for a long time, and I've seen a lot of things change, and some things, not as much. Sometimes they're just improvements, and some. And and we don't always uh, distinguish improvements, um, and innovation, and at the same time, in all the improvements we had, for instance, on the fuel efficiency of cars, we have used in, in order to. Uh, have airco and also television screens in cars and uh, that sort of thing. So sometimes our behavior uh, get big, these big monsters rather than small cars that we used to have. So um, you can also squander that advantage. Right. <laughs> um, but the question was when is uh, um, uh, it's go that's going to take quite some time to to do. Um, uh, and on the other hand, I also think that we might see some quick advances. Yeah? Um, and it's, it's, it's always been like that. The quick and slow goes together. So if you expect that when tomorrow you get up and you live in a completely different energy system, you're going to be disappointed. Right. But, um, if, uh, and that sounds really uh, old if I say that, but if you look back, if I look back 10 years, which you guys can do too, if you remember, then um, then things have changed. Right. Yeah? Yes. We have biofuels. Yeah. We have second generation biofuels are coming in. Uh, ten years ago, it was really bad stuff that was competing with food. So there there is progress in that we're trying to uh, hammer out the, the right things to do. Uh, with hydrogen, what I find exciting is that we all think it's going to be uh, el electrolysis, but the carrier in which it will hit our shore is still undetermined. Mm -hmm. yeah? So also that is, and, and, and it has different organizational aspects to it. What sort of infrastructure do you need? What organization? Before we enter this complete transition, um, in the meantime, 
Asia, we've seen that Asia's uh, demand is growing massively. Could you say a bit more about the role of Asia on the global market and how it will affect yeah. Europe, the prices and supply here? Well, may, may, maybe, because it very much links uh, uh, to the, your right to now go to Asia, because in Asia, gas is the transition fuel. Right. Um, in Japan, for example, that's a... Maybe in Japan less so, but in uh, definitely in China, uh, Thailand, okay. uh, so... Uh, and what, what makes uh, Asia so different is that they don't have an internal market. Pipelines really end at the border. Um, so there's, there's very little collaboration. Uh, it's all still very vertically organized through state companies that they, they are sent to make sure that they, uh, they get enough supplies. Um, and then there is China, which is a very large market, and India, not to for, uh, forget, uh, India has a, uh, maybe not the, the best developed gas system, but has uh, particularly gas f in order to quickly reduce air pollution, yeah? which is also something, you know, in the 1970s, we ha we, uh, w when we went from coal to uh, gas-powered uh, stations, the air also improved quite a lot here in the Netherlands, I remember that. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and so for China in, in the cities, they basically decided, uh, for instance, for Beijing, I sat in conferences where they announced, okay, next year we will have finished, all coal will re be removed from the first ring, that's how they referred, and then the year after we do the second ring and the third ring and the fourth ring. Um, and so uh, once we heard that, that was a couple of years ago, you could, you could just do the math and think, oh, that's a lot of gas. Um, and so uh, that's when... Um, and maybe 10 years ago, we might have worried, if Qatar develops its huge field in LNG, will there be enough demand? And then, of course, the tsunami happened in Japan, and they closed all their nuclear. And thank God that project was yeah. developed that way, because there was a surplus of gas. And all of a sudden, Japan was mostly saved by the fact that there was uh, uh, f the flexibility of the LNG uh, was available to them. Yeah. And next to LNG, you can also supply gas through pipelines, like we've talked mm -hmm. enough about Nord Stream 2 and the pipelines that Russia has to Europe. Uh, but Russia is also constructing pipelines to China to supply them directly through well, pipelines. Yeah, 40 BCM. Okay. Um, would this mean that we are comp competing with uh, Asia directly through these pipelines? We already do so. I mean, first, of course, through LNG. And increasingly, uh, uh, Russia figured out that uh, if Europe is no longer their their premium market, where they uh, their premium stable market, uh, also because we are in energy transition and foresee that the role of gas in our energy systems will decline. I'm not saying will go away very, but, but at least will be stagnant or decline. Uh, then, of course, a growing market is much more attractive. So yes, we we will compete through the pipeline. Currently, for 40 BCM, that's overseeable given the the size of the flows. There's more to come, probably. Uh, but if they if they expand that system, then uh, there will be more. But what Russia is going to do is actually expand their ability to uh, export through LNG, because also the relationship between China and Russia is also very interesting. I mean, they uh, concluded that uh, pipeline in 2000 March 2014. They finally had a contract on what price. And, uh, and so they could begin to construct. And then, of course, the prices were much lower. So I'm sure in China they said, well, you might not want to hurry too much. And now, of course, it's attractive uh, under the current prices. Um, but Russia also does not want to repeat its mistake uh, because we talk about security of supply. They talk about security of demand, that when you're too dependent on one market, yeah, um, that works both ways, yeah? both for the buyer and the seller. So yeah. they they are actually have been announcing that we uh, that they are going to expand their LNG uh, send out capacity, uh, and then of course uh, Europe will have to uh, uh, think if we uh, if we take less through pipeline, do we have enough capacity through LNG terminals? Right. Yeah. To finish up. Um, how do you think the gas market will behave this year? And maybe for the people watching, uh, should you fix your contract right now? Or should you wait 
until perhaps the Nord Stream 2 opens this summer? Or what do you think the prices will do? What can um, we expect? This is very dangerous. Huh? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my little... <laughs> this is why everyone watches this video for <laughs> an hour. Yeah, yeah, but my, my little foundation, of course, is not insured for, uh, for any litigation. So the, uh, now we read the text where it says that any... No commercial uh, uh, whatever can be attached to what I say. Uh, so, I mean, that's... You're not giving uh, any financial advice. No, 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 no. Um, of course, it, what you're asking for is the retail market, which is different from... Sure, let's the talk about market, the retail yeah? market. We've talked about the other um, ones. But the way it works is, is not always clear to people. Okay. Um, and, and also, if you... Uh, if you see what's been going on lately with the smaller companies, of course, you wonder what their business model is with buying and selling. I can, I understand how it works in a in a well supplied market, uh, but in a tight market, you can see that some of these business models are difficult. Yeah? Okay. Um, if, if I look at the market, and you know, if I if I move away from the retail market, then. Um, uh, It is possible, um, since Europe uh, had very low storages to begin with in this market and is drawing on its storages now, that the additional gas we have to buy next year um, might might be that extra demand on the market that we we will uh, create some upside uh, pressure on the on prices. Although American production is beginning to grow again. The LNG production, the LNG, and so liquefied and, natural gas, and, and of course you, your production can grow, but if you don't have a liquefier to, uh, so that you can put it in a ship, then nothing happens. But there's also some projects coming online, um, so that doesn't look entirely bad. But the way it looks is that next year is also going to be uh, the likelihood that is going that is going to be tough or tight is uh, is not gone. Okay. Yeah. Um, what does that mean for you uh, uh, at home? Um, what it means is that you're now being confronted with the fact that since 2014 you probably pay too little for investments to take place mm -hmm. to make sure that the market didn't get tight and now you're paying for cash up. Um, of course that's not going to make you any happy. No. Right? Because that's not your problem. But it's a good explanation. Um, yeah, but, but a lot of people, the way they are being, uh, what, what worries me, let me put it, what worries me is that the budget contracts yeah, are usually with the people who cannot afford the risk that are attached to these mm -hmm. contracts with flexible prices. And yeah. I don't know whether companies are so keen to uh, offer me a, a three-year contract uh, unless it's for the... Uh, for for uh, for a very high price. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is like shifting risk around, and who's going to pay for it? And uh, it's a worrying sight. Yeah, yeah, because I think as consumer, what we don't understand always is that we pay too little in winter. Uh, for instance, in the U.S., that's not the case. Eh? So, uh, end of January, the, they send a bill every two months. So then around Christmas, no bill. So you know you think you're rich and you love a lot of people. So you buy a lot of presents for people. And then end of January, when you're hitting a rock bottom on, on your, uh, Blue Monday. On your uh, <laughs> account, then the gas bill and the electricity bill comes. Um, uh, here in, the, here in, uh, in, in most European countries, there's also a social measure that in the summer you pay too much, in the winter too little. Uh, in part so that uh, your bill is predictable, so you can manage your your uh, your bills. Yeah. Um, already, you see some companies now say, "Oh, I can give you a, a flexibility per hour or per 15 minutes or whatever," um, and that might seem attractive. But the question is that it, it's maybe not very attractive for people with very small wallets who can not really afford it. Yeah, is there a role for the Dutch government perhaps to step in? Because, it, because it's like going back to the old system when I, first time I went to London with my high school a hundred years ago, um, you still had to throw pennies, yeah? So if you don't have pennies, your light doesn't come on right. and your heater doesn't work, huh? That, that's, that's the reality and of course, we are not used to that. Yeah? 
for the, for us that we cannot imagine that because um, we we've, we've been very spoiled, like I said, for a very long time with ample gas, with our own Dutch gas, and and now it's tight and. Uh, Another question that I had for you as a director working in the en energy sector for over 20 years, um, isn't the energy sector a man's world? Um, actually, I worked in energy a lot longer. Eh? Um, yeah, when I started out, I mean, there was not very many women interested in that part of the energy uh, sector. So, yeah, I guess so. But even when I was in university, um, uh, then more women began to study, obviously. Uh, but the, uh, within faculties and kind of specializations, there was still like, um, you know, certain flows. And uh, I went to political economy, and that was not really a girl's thing, let's put it this way. Um, and um, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I must say, I, I got used to it. Probably became just as rude as, uh, oh no, I shouldn't say that. Um, have certain developed certain qualities in my personality that maybe are not very lady ladylike um, in order to survive because yeah uh, you know, if you want to be heard you sometimes have to be loud right um, which is hard you know yeah but uh, I've learned one thing if you convince yourself you're doing something not for yourself but for other pe to to defend other people your courage actually grows yeah. So then you can overcome your own uh, shyness. Uh, but, you know, sometimes uh, uh, I time things. Then uh, uh, when a guy talks and for five minutes, it still seems shorter than when a woman talks for five minutes. And that's something that's going to take a while, I think. And then they say, well, you've talked enough now. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny. I mean, it's just funny, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> but you just you just have to keep on uh, going yourself. Yeah. And, um, and and there's one thing: if you know your stuff, yeah, that's always been my strategy. If I try to really know my stuff, come well prepared, know what I'm doing, um, know it perhaps better than than other people, then uh, uh, that was, that was my survival strategy. That. Um, and I was, I, I'm really only interested in the content and not in all the frills around it. So for me, that was, that worked as a strategy that I just thought, you know, the content and the rest. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, I don't, I don't really care. And, yeah. uh, if there's one thing that you would want our viewers to take away from this interview, what, what would that be? In a few um, uh, uh, for one thing, energy transition is really exciting because it involves politics, economics and technology, so I, I, I would say that's a, But also these traditional markets that everyone is um, so critical about, you need to follow them because they... Um, also the price of natural gas even um, still determines yeah, quite a lot what happens in the CO2 and in the, uh, in the hydrogen uh, value chains and the valuation and the costs and the prices. And so um, uh, we need knowledge of both for quite some time to come. That doesn't mean to say that you are, you are promoting it or something because young people might be afraid of that. But what I, what I find strange, I think maybe a growing something is easier than shrinking something. In terms of, suppose a company says, okay, well, you know, we don't see any future in natural gas in, in Europe anymore because they said by 2050 they're not going. Suppose they quit before we have changed all the houses or before, yeah? So, uh, because for them the business case might not be there. So, it's really, it's from an academic uh, level, if you want to do interesting work, both new and old, it's really complicated stuff. And that should be fun. I mean, if it's too easy, then there's no fun, right? Yeah. So uh, I would say, like, what we need is actually creative minds around all these issues, not just uh, 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 cherry picking because it uh, looks good, but we owe it to people who have not studied this and are, have smaller wallets that we figure out how to do that so that they do not feel any change and can live their life, yeah? Without any major financial hits. 
Uh, I see that that is what we, we, what we promise to do when we graduate. That is what it's all about. Yeah? How good are you going to use your brain for society, not for yourself alone? Yeah? Yeah. I think that's a great way yeah. to end yeah. this interview. Thank you very much Thank for so talking much to us today. To us. Thank you. It's getting a bit nippy now, but... Uh, it's getting quite cool with all the windows <laughs> um, open. But thank but, you, you so know, much. But then we're healthy, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it still all works. <laughs>